Chema, was macht ihr? How are you? I hope everyone is gesund, stark, und freilich, begasht mich zu berücknis. The hour is late, the Zerab Shabbat is Kodesh. I started late, I'm not feeling so well. I beg your forgiveness. Well, today we're going to speak about a subject which in a way gets to the heart of Judaism. And it's something we've spoken about many times and that sometimes I feel like things are repeated. But I guess when we get to the essence of Yiddishkeit again and again, we see the beauty, we see the wonder, and we see the awesomeness. And we have to stress this idea again and again. This week we're learning Pashas Mishpatim. We'll start with the prayer, which is very in sync with the theme of this week's talk, which is about social justice, civil law. We pray for wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. We pray to have the right das. Das is wisdom, knowledge, understanding. You know, seichel, intellect, I would say is the most supreme thing of this world, of this world. And, you know, we could say it's a gishmak. It's the most enjoyable thing. It's the greatest taiva. What's greater than seichel? What's more beautiful than understanding? What's more awesome than understanding? What's greater than intellect of this world? In a way, nothing. You know, love is more important. Good character traits is more important. But if you talk about what's enjoyable, what lights us up, and in the human being, in the model, even according to Torah, we say, Chabad, Chagas, Nehi. It starts with Chabad. Chochma, Binatas. That's the highest faculties of man. So we pray to Hashem that these highest faculties, which are, in a way, our most powerful weapons, should be channeled correctly. Should come to the correct conclusions to be spot on, accurate, in sync with the will of Hashem. And this is what Pash Mishpatim is all about. Mishpatim, the name Mishpatim means the laws. And we all know the famous discussion that Chassidus has about three categories of mitzvahs. Now those mitzvahs that are called Mishpatim, which even if God would not have commanded us, we'd come to the conclusion that we are obligated to act in such an upright, ethical, moral manner. Honor your parents, don't steal, don't kill. These are called mishpatim. Then we have edus, the mitzvahs that are called testimonial, they have an historical context. They remind us of something. That's why they're called edus. They're witnesses. We look at this mitzvah, it tells us something about our history. Either mitzvahs that are connected, let's say, for example, with matzah, morer, which we eat by the Seder on Pesach, to remind us of our exodus. Or, for example, Shabbos. One of the reasons behind Shabbos is to remind us that Hashem created the world and He rested on the seventh day. Those are called Eidus. And Chassidus explains that if we weren't commanded those commandments, but once we, we wouldn't do them, but once we were commanded, then we understand. So, like Tzachop, our seichel also could agree with it. But then comes the chukim. Chukim are those mitzvahs that have no rationale, that are not connected to intellect whatsoever. Chukim is, for example, concepts like tumah and tara, purity, impurity, kashu, streif, kosher, etc. So then that's a separate category, which we say that the only reason we're doing it is straight up because Hashem commanded us. And our human intellect would never come to the conclusion that we should do those mitzvahs. So now... Let's look at the first couple of Rashi's in Mishpat, and we'll skim over them quickly to show the two sides of a Jew learning Torah. And what does it mean, especially when we're learning that part of Torah, which, from a certain perspective, we'd say human intellect, pure human intellect, will come to the conclusion, the same conclusions. So let's take a look straight away. The Rashi's here are so chsiddish, the first couple of Rashi's. The first one, Ve'ela mishpatim, kol makam shenema ela, every time that it says these, 
it rejects posel as rishonim, but when it says ve'ele, when there's a vav that adds and these, then we say it adds to that which was previous. And here comes the famous line from Rashi: Ma'i rishonim misinai, af elu misinai. Just like what we spoke in the last parsha, Yisrael came from Sinai. So too, these laws, the civil laws, between man and man, comes from Sinai. I'm not going to continue the Rashi. We'll soon get to the issue in a second, but let's go further. Hashem tells Moshe, these are the laws you shall place before them. And Hashem says, This is a message for teachers and leaders. And parents, don't think you'll just be able to teach it to them two or three times. I think the average teacher, if he has to teach it three times, is already getting highly agitated. What here tells Moshe, Hashem tells Moshe, don't think you can just teach it two or three times. No. I'm not going to bother myself to really give them the understanding, the logic, the motive which is behind the laws. You have to place it before them. It has to be so digestible, so prepared, that they could take it and internalize it. And Lefneim also says, It should become totally one with them. That means it might take a lot more than two or three times. Next Rashi. Lefneim, place before them the Jews. The loyal of Negoyim, but not before non Jews. And the affiliate but then Echad, even if you know about a certain matter of law, Shem Dunno is a Kadini Yisrael, that the non Jew will come to the same conclusion. You're not allowed to bring it. Berkoy Shalahem, you're not allowed to bring it to a non Jewish court. So straight away in Rashi, we see this duality, we see this paradox of the otherworldliness, divinity, holiness, sacredness of the civil laws. And at the same time, we see their practicality. They're down to earth. They're of this worldness. So let's go to the first Rashi. Over here we're stressing that this is not man-made. Everyone knows the famous Batanur in the beginning of Pirkei Ovis, and I'm sure I mentioned it already before. Why Pirkei Ovis starts? Why Pirkei Avis? Every Masech could have started the same way. We could have started Pesachim, the same thing. And he said, whoever the last person we mentioned, the following law. Every single Masech could have told us how it was passed down from us and started at the very beginning. And the Batanur says, tremendous, wonderful thing, is that no, because most laws, let's say we're learning Pesachim or whatever, Nidda, Shabbos, most laws, of course they came from Sinai. Moshe Kibbal Tehidim Sinai. Moshe didn't make it up himself, especially like we said before, if we're talking about Edus and Chukim. But Pirkei Avois, which talks about sayings of our sages, every culture has their sages. Confucius say, yada, yada, yada. Benjamin Franklin say, yidi, yidi, yidi. And so on and so forth. The sayings of our sages, the sayings of our fathers. Wisdom, Korbu quotes. <laughs> People love Korbu quotes. You could say that Piki Ovis is the Korbu quotes of our sages. Here comes the Batanura and gives us the message of Torah. That even the quotable quotes of our sages was not man-made, but there was also received from Sinai. It's divinity. It's connected to God. So to over here. In the Parsha, which is called Mishpatim, which talks about social laws, civil laws, between man and man, damages, properties, acquisitions, etc., etc., you have to know it's not man-made. This is also from God. Which we've spoken about this before. In other words, God is the one who defines and gives us the definitions of what is justice and what is ethics and what is morality. By the way, that's the first Rashi. So in other words, it stresses the divinity of it. Next Rashi, where he says, Tosim you have to present the logic 
the Talmud logic, the Torah logic, until it becomes one with the human mind. That's the beauty of Torah Shabal Peh, especially. We're not stressing the divinity. Of course we understand Misinai. But at the same time, we got to bring it down and we should become united with it, with our human intellect. We see it on a human level, how it's the best way. Of course, because this is what we see from Sinai. But now I'm going to rack my brains and work it out, how this makes the most sense on a human level, so to speak. But then comes the next Rashi. Even if they come to the same conclusion. So now again, we're stressing the otherworldliness, the godliness, the Jewish dimension, which has nothing to do with human intellect. So, we can give examples of this later, at this as a side point. I believe this is like another one of the things a person could do to make his life very interesting, is to make a study in the contrast of the social laws of Pashat Mishpatim to see what Judaism has to say, and I understand there has been such books written and studies made. And then to contrast the definitions and the case histories, scenarios, precedents, call whatever you want, of social law in Yiddishkeit and social law in the secular courts. In many cases, of course, they come to the same conclusion. And I would argue that itself is because they started from the Bible. But in many cases, there's no way ever they would come to the same conclusion. You know what? I'll give one example straight away, and then we'll get to the crux of what I want to talk about today. Let's say, for example, Im Kesef Talva. This week, the Torah mentions the idea of a free loan. And Rashi says, Im is not Rishus, but Chayva. You're obligated. Now, we know according to Jewish law, a loan means even for a rich man. So now let me ask you a question. We're going to go over to somebody on the street, and we're going to say it like this. There's a person, and he has $100 million. Another person is going to come over to him who has only $10 million. And he owns four shops. And he's going to go over to the one who has $100 million. And says, I want to open up a fifth shop. Can I borrow some money, interest-free? The guy's going to say, so let me get this straight. <laughs> I don't understand what you say. You want me to give you money. You should make profit on those dollars. When you're not a poor man... And I should lose by giving you this money interest-free. It doesn't make sense. Go to the bank, pay interest, no problem. And by the way, let's say that person would, doesn't mind. I'm, we're talking now in theory. But still we're saying that according to Judaism, you must give him the money. Why? Because that's the commandment. To loan another rich person interest-free. I'm just giving you an example. There's more examples. You know, without elaborating, I'll just mention one more. This is a very famous one because the Gemara talks about it. If you see the donkey of your enemy, you must help him. And then the Gemara comes along and says a famous question. Which one comes first? Your enemy or your friend? You're driving down Highway 66. You see your friend that's in trouble and you see your enemy. Now the Torah calls him your enemy. Why does the Torah call him your enemy? Because we're talking about that person who's a thief, who's a scam artist, who's involved in very dodgy activities. And the Gemara says, who do you help first? Seinacho or Eyacho? Torah says, Seinacho. But why? And then the Gemara says, to make you a better person. So again, I challenge any person on this planet Earth to be asked that question and to come to the right answer according to Ratzin HaElyon, the will of Hashem. Why? Because there's human intellect and there's godly intellect. Human intellect is not going to come to the same conclusion as godly intellect in every case, obviously. And therefore, the Jewish definition of charity, kindness, and all these things has to be according to where the Torah defines it. And only if you follow the Torah will you know if you're doing what the Abish wants or not. And this is the message over here. What we have to give over to our children and to our students. And it all lies in a very interesting Hasidic interpretation of the Elam Mishpatim, Ashutasim Lufnaim Kisikne. Hasidus asks a very famous question. Why does the Pasuk say, Hashem is talking to Moshe, the Elam Mishpatim, Ashutasim Lufnaim, these are the laws you should put before them. So he's talking to Moshe and then he's speaking 
lifneihem. This is what you should put before them. So he's talking about the rabbin, the nation, and then he says kisikne evidivi when you will acquire a slave. L'chayra the pasuk should said kiyiknu when they will acquire a slave. Obviously, the simple answer is according to Pshat. But according to Chassidus, there's a beautiful interpretation here. That the Kisikne is still talking to Moshe. Kisikne is talking to Moshe. He has to teach. The way he's going to transmit Judaism and the civil laws is in a way of Kisikne. And what is in the words of Kisikne? And this again and again, the beauty of Judaism how it has both aspects. As we discussed till now, the otherworldliness, the divinity, the God himself, and at the same time, how Hashem himself comes down into a way that we can understand it with our human intellect. What does it mean that Moshe Rabbeinu should teach it in a way of kisikne? Number one, kisikne is, like a, it means a kinyin. But a kinyin over here is referring to two things. What does it mean, a Kenyan? A Kenyan goes together with the Rashi, where Rashi says that you have to put it before them like a Shulchan Aruch, it's prepared. Teach it in a way, Kisikna, that it becomes theirs, like a Kenyan acquisition. Today in education, one of the major themes is ownership. In life in general, ownership. Take responsibility. But ownership, it becomes yours. When you're teaching to a student... The greatest, greatest thing of your achievement and accomplishment is when whatever you teach them becomes theirs. It becomes totally one with them. And if we're talking about mishpatim, it means ki sickness, in gansen, in kop, in seichel, in human intellect. You're so thorough in teaching and you're so talented in such a good way and you have so much patience until... It's like engraved in them totally that it becomes one with them as their acquisition. But then there's another interpretation of Kisikna. See, this explains in the Pasik. We say by Kiddush Lavana, Baruch Oiseich, blessed is your maker. Baruch Yetzirch, blessed is he who fashioned you. Baruch Bayrech, blessed is your creator. Baruch Koinech, blessed is your master. Blessed is your owner. And Chassidus explains, according to Kabbalah, that over here we're talking about the four worlds. Oisech, Baruch Oisech, Malash Nasiya, the world of Asiya. Baruch Yitzech, Milash Yitzir, the world of Yitzira. Baruch Boirech, the world of Bria. Baruch Koinech goes on Atzilus. Atzilus is considered Iu B'chayei Hashem himself. It's considered a revelation of God. Not so much a creation. What's the first level of creation? Bria. Oilam Abriya is the world of creation. That's considered when there's a certain sense of independence and I and separateness. The world of Briya in a very subtle form. But Atzilus is Gilei Lakus. How should you teach? Moshe, Rabbeinu, all teachers, all parents. When you're teaching Yiddishkeit, when you're transmitting Yiddishkeit to the next generation, it has to be in the way as they did Heren, they sense Adas is Koinech. The world of Atzilus is called Hashem's Kenyan. It's Mamish one with him. There's, there's only, you only sense the master, not that he made something. There's only a master. That's the sense of Atzilus. When you teach Torah, you have to teach Torah in such a way that they feel, it's the Abish himself. And this experience of uniting Yichud Niflash and Yichud Kamoya with the Abish himself is happening every single time a person learns Torah. No, you say not Torah. So here we get the message. Kisikna. On the one hand, we emphasize, like we spoke many times about the concept of the Lamaila Mena Seichel, Kumtarop and Seichel, of the Sublight Lamaila Mena Seichel. On the one hand, we emphasize how the Torah comes down into intellect. There's nothing like Talmud logic. There's nothing like Talmud learning. There's nothing like Chochmah Torah. There's nothing as enjoyable. There's nothing as exciting. There's nothing as amazing. There's nothing like the layers of Pshat, Remesh, Drush, Soyed. Ask anybody who likes and learns Torah, Shashu'i, Atzmuscha. There's nothing like it. 
on a gishmak level. Tamuru kitoiva vaye. So, so noichi al imro secho kimeitze shalolro. So we, on the one hand, we emphasize sikne, that we understand it. We bring it down like a shulchan we, 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 we engrave it more and more that it becomes totally one with us. That's the ownership part. How the godly intellect united with the human intellect. But on the other hand, we're constantly aware. Ashabach abonu mikol ha'amin v'nosal nonu v'steirosu. We're so lucky that this is the beauty, this is the amazing, amazing thing of Torah, that at the same time that it became united with our brains and the human intellect, it really, really remains something which is Hashem Himself. How is it possible that it should be Hashem Himself, total infinity, and at the same time it unites with human intellect? That's another whole discussion. But that itself is one of the amazing, amazing things that Hashem could do, the finite and the infinite become as one. And each one stays true. It's finite, but at the same time, it's really infinite. Simultaneously. And therefore, both of these aspects are happening together. And therefore, we see straight away in all the Rashis, these two ideas going on at the same time. And this is the connection, it's Shabbos Mavarchim Oder. And Oder, the Rebbe said, is the words Aleph Dor. Aleph goes on Hashem Dor, how he comes down into the world. Mishpatim is a prime example of the idea how the godly wisdom permeates the world, gives us a code, a way of life, and defines to us how we should live. Bein Odom Lechavere, that's Aleph Dar. The Shabbos is also Pasha Shkolem, same idea, taking things of the physical world and elevating it and donating it to Hashem. So everything and everything, as we spoke many times, is about making a dira b'tachtenim, and the primary function of dira b'tachtenim, in a way, starts with the human brain. The ultimate is also with your body to sit and learn, sit down, attach your anatomy to a chair, that's also your tachtoinim. Shake, shake, shake while you're learning a Gemara. That's also part of kolatz moise temana. Everything is about how the godliness permeates the physicality. And if we will do our job properly in permeating the physicality, more and more we'll come to the day we'll, we'll see how it happens totally. The gula mitzvah shleimo take it from yad, mamish kuchabes, posting from my home, Be'ez Hashem Yisbarich, your man in Melbourne.